This morning's message is called an unbroken promise. Let's look, go ahead and read 2 Samuel chapter 9, verses uh, 1 through 7. 2 Samuel 9, verses <coughs> 1 through 7. Starting reading in verse 1. And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he is in the house of Maker, the son of Amiel and Lodabar. Then, the, then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of Maker, the son of Amiel from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake, and I will restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would speak just as you did in the song service and through the word that you gave us, Lord God, that you would also speak through the preaching of your gospel, Lord. We pray that you'd prepare our hearts to be receptive to your truth. Holy Spirit, I pray that you wouldn't only anoint me to speak your word, but that you would anoint the hearts of your people to receive your word. We give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. An unbroken promise is what we're talking about this morning. You know, a few weeks back, we, well, for some time now, we've been going through the Bible like we normally do, and we've been studying in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, which tells us the story of David. Essentially, tells us uh, a lot about the life of King David. And a few weeks back, we talked about David and Jonathan's friendship. I don't know if y'all remember that. And whenever we talked about David and Jonathan's friendship, we were introduced for the first time to this character named Mephibosheth. Um, Mephibosheth, when the Bible mentions him, we were told back, the, back then when we were studying on Wednesday night, we were told that Saul, his grandfather, and Jonathan, his father, were killed in battle. They were killed by the Philistines. And when the news reached back to the home front, Mephibosheth, really in the King James, it says his milkmaid, uh, it, which is... the we won't get into the details. Let's just say it's a nanny, okay? His nanny heard the news that Jonathan and Saul had died. And in a state of panic, she grabbed the child in her arms and she took off running to flee for whatever was going to happen. Because now the king of Israel, which Mephibosheth was an heir to the throne... Her, the, the, the king was dead, and so now the family was at risk. And so she attempted with her own logic and in her own strength to save the young child. And in her arms, she fell. Great was her fall. So much so that the child became crippled, and from that day forward, he was never the same. He was lame in his feet, and he was crippled from the day that that fall took place. Before this occurrence, the story of David and Mephibosheth's father, Jonathan's friendship was described to us. I want to kind of back up a little bit to bring us to where we are. Their friendship was described. The Bible states <coughs> that, uh, that their souls were united. Whenever, whenever the Bible talks about Jonathan and David, it says that their souls had become as one. Now, I need you to understand that spiritually, all aspects of this story regarding Saul, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, Saul, he's included, David, Jonathan, Mephibosheth, all elements of this story are very rich with New Testament spirituality, all right? And the reason why I want the, uh, what I'm going to start with is the fact that David is a type of Jesus for many reasons. 
I'm not going to go into all the reasons, but when you hear about King David, you need to think about Jesus. One of the reasons is this. Look at Luke 132. You can put the scripture up. We talked about it just recently. But in Luke 132, the angel Gabriel came to Mary and he said in that, in that to, he told Mary essentially that your son, your offspring is going to sit. Look, it says God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. Hallelujah. Another thing, David was God's choice. We've talked about this when we've been studying in 1 Samuel. The fact that the people wanted what they wanted. They said, give us a king. And so God gave them what they wanted. He, gave them, he, he allowed them to have their way and their will. He allowed them to have Saul. Saul is a type of the flesh because whenever God's people want what they want outside of God's will, it's a representation of the flesh. The, Saul was what the people wanted. David was what God wanted. Can you stop real quick and think of times in your life that you wanted something that was outside of God's will? God let you have it anyway, but it didn't really bless you. Instead, it ended up cursing you. That's right. You know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the same thing that's been going on through the ages of God's people where they choose and want what they want. That's a type of Saul, the flesh, when the whole time God's holding in his hand what he really has for them. That's a type of Jesus. That's David. Amen. So David in the story is, is a type of Jesus. And the relationship between Jonathan and David is a type of the relationship between Jesus and the believer. Because the Bible says that they were, their souls had become one. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 20. I'm sorry. You can go there. 1 Samuel chapter 20 verse 14 through 17. But in this scripture I'm talking about covenant. That's why this relationship between David and Jonathan, that's the first point that I wanted to make, is like the relationship between the believer and Jesus because they, they had a covenant with one another. Amen? Let's look at this. It says, And you shall not only while yet I live show me kindness. This is Jonathan speaking to David. Not only while I live shall you show me kindness of the Lord that I die not. Because see, you know what the, what's going on here is Jonathan knows that David has been anointed to be king. Jonathan knows that it's inevitable. He is not going to be the king of Israel. Even though he is Saul's son, he's not going to sit on the throne. God has chosen David. David is going to sit on the throne. Yet at the same time, David and Jonathan are very close to one another. Their souls are connected to one another. And Jonathan is saying, hey, show me kindness that I die not. All right, next verse. But also that you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off the enemies of David, everyone from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord even require at the hand of David's enemies. We don't have to go to the next verse. You see the concept here. A covenant, which is an agreement that was made between the type who David, who is Jesus, the type Jonathan, who describes the church, which is the, which is made up of you and I. Look at look at what it says in 1 Samuel 20, verse 19. Because we're talking about the fact that their hearts were united. Their hearts were one. It says uh, and when thou hast stayed three days, then shalt thou go down quickly and come to the place where thou didst hide thyself when the business. Did I say 19? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Lord. I must have got the must have got the wrong verse. Here we go. That's a, that's 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 perfect. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, let me just, you just have to trust me on this. Because we're not going to go back and search for it. I put the wrong verse. The point is this, and it's okay, because you know what? It's a good thing that the preacher messes up. Because we don't want him functioning in his own capabilities anyway, because they're not really that good. Amen? Praise God. The point is, is this, is that David and Jonathan, hallelujah, the Bible says their souls were united. They were one. If you talk to somebody in the world, they're going to try to come up with something wrong for this. I'm telling you right now, they will use this as a reason. This is not in my notes. I don't even really want to go here, but I want to make a point because the devil probably whispered in your ear too. Because the devil is a liar and the father of lies and he's the king of perversion. Yeah. 
And he will try to whisper in people's ears that something perverted was going on here. And I'm here to tell you that this is not what it was. These, these two men were as close as friends as what men could be. But the Bible is using it as a type to prepare the way for us, to paint a picture for us of the New Testament relationship that takes place to the believer whenever he is born again in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 6 verse 5. Because in New Testament Christianity, when the covenant of God is embraced, amen, a new life is given. Look what it says right here. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. What I need you to know is this, is that that word planted right there, in some translations, in some of the newer translations, the word is united. What it means is to be born together, to have been implanted by birth or nature. The word in the Greek language has this prefix connected to it. Now, sometimes I just go off on a whim and I believe that it's the Lord that, that puts it in my heart. And I don't tell you all about it because sometimes I don't have time to check on it. All right. Y'all just got to trust me sometimes. <laughs> And a while back, I told y'all, and this is how I say it, though, because I, I always tell you if it's my opinion, I'm going to let you know. I say, I'm quite certain that this is where we get our word synonym from. This morning, I looked it up. <laughs> and this is exactly where we get the word synonym from. This prefix, sin, talks about, S-Y-N, talks about the fact that something has a similar origin, whereas the word Oman, the synonym, it means name, the same name. And the point that I'm trying to make is this, is that in the Greek, this prefix is used to describing togetherness, a unitedness. Don't get lost in the, in the woods of what I'm trying to say here. I'm trying to say that the relationship between Jonathan and and David was a type of the relationship between you and I. When we put our faith in Christ, hallelujah, we become one with him. Listen, I'm talking about a new birth that takes place where the old man, born like Adam. Come on, somebody. See, because what I'm trying to tell you is this. We have within this story the fall. We have within this story the fall of humanity. A child that's in the arms of this woman. Who's fleeing and trying and attempting in her own strength and her own logic to make things right. And she falls down and this child is crippled. Now the entire human race is crippled That's right. from the power of sin that has entered the human race. And mankind can no longer walk right. He can no longer stand up straight and do what it is that God has called him to do. But hallelujah, God has a covenant a covenant relationship where he would send his own son, hallelujah, typified by David to die on a cross. A sacrificial covenant to die on a cross so that a relationship, a unitedness can take place between that which will believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ and believe in the plan that God the Father offered. And be, if you were planted together with him in the likeness of his death, so shall you be in the likeness of his resurrection. Yeah. New life, new hope, a second chance. He will bring restoration. Look. The boy couldn't walk. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 13. I love this. I love this scripture right here. I remember the first time I, I really got a revelation of it. It was after the church had started. I preached in one of those early services. Might have even been the first service we had here. I think it was before we even fixed this place up on a Christmas. But hey, Robert, whenever we had that first service, we hadn't re redecorated this place, have we? On that Christmas service? Yeah. I think I use this scripture in that scripture in that, on that service. It says, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. God's new covenant wants to bring healing. I've got the picture right here. You know, this is Mephibosheth. I don't know what it looks like. I don't even know if he can walk. I don't know if his legs are so crippled up that he got to crawl. I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell me with certainty exactly how bad off it was. I don't know if he was so small and crippled up that they had to just fling him up on his shoulder and carry him around. But I do know this. This scripture right here is talking about a lame foot that's causing you to kind of walk off the path. 
a, a, a foot that's kind of crooked, and it just causes you not to be able to walk straight, not to be able to walk the pathway that you're supposed to walk. This is a type of the spiritual crippledness and lameness that we receive from our father Adam that keeps causing us to venture off the, the, the path that God has provided for mankind. That's what John the Baptist said. The Bible says that John the Baptist went to make a way for the way. Amen. A hadas, a clearly traveled pathway. The gospel of Jesus Christ gives us a clearly traveled pathway. But the lame and the crippled feet that we receive from our father Adam cause us to go off. He's lame and he can't walk. He's without hope. But King David calls with kindness. Is there anybody of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? Jesus calls all the lame from all over to come home today. The gospel message proclaims that no matter where you are, who you are, where you've been, you can have a new life with the king. You can live with him in his house. He offers even the lame a place at the king's table. He offers new hope and a new start. Amen? That brings me to point number one, getting rid of the idol. I want, what I want you to know is, is that the name Mephibosheth, well, that's a big, that's a mouthful, huh? That's a tongue twister, Mephibosheth. Say that 20 times real fast. <laughs> Mephibosheth. The, you know what the name of Mephibosheth, <laughs> Mephibosheth, you know what it means? It means exterminating the idols. Hmm. When we hear the word idol, the natural tendency is for us <laughs> to think about a statue, Right? And if we're not careful, listen to me, wait, pay it, don't fall asleep on me, because they're put it in my notes. If we're not careful, we're going to think, I'm not Catholic anymore, I'm going to take a nap till he gets to point number two. This doesn't have anything to do with me. Huh? I got you, Brother Larry. No, that's not what we're talking about. Spiritually speaking, an idol is anything that gets between God and his people. The false idols of the Old Testament pulled Israel away spiritually from God. And the statues or idols that sit in Catholic churches and sit in people's yards, you know what they do? They promote a false spirituality and they prevent people from being able to see the one true God and accessing him the proper way. You can't pray to a bunch of saints. You can't pray to Jesus' mama in order to access the grace of God. You have to go through Calvary. You have to go through faith in the only begotten Son of God, the one who was sent to earth to die on the cross. I'm not preaching hate. I'm preaching truth. And anything else, amen, prevents people from getting access. I know I was delivered out of it. Thank you, Lord. He did not, we're not talking about just his body hanging on a, on a crucifix. We're talking about a word, a work taking place on the inside of the heart. So that we can experience new life. The false gods in the Old Testament demanded worship that was sensual. Now what do you think of when you hear that word sensual? Because it's not probably what I'm necessarily thinking of. What I'm trying to communicate. Oh, you think sexual. That's not even really exactly what I'm saying. Although I will say that those false gods required sexual type practices. Mm -hmm. But can I tell you that why? Because they were, they, were, they were representing Satan. And what does he do? He perverts everything. He turns everything into something that's wrong. Even something that God gave mankind, he turns it into perversion. You, you understand what I'm saying? Each and every one of us don't. Listen, ain't none of us in this place can sit here and act like we all holy like that. Because I can venture to say that even the most purest person physically in this place has thought something wrong in their mind. And we won't go there. But my point is, is this. I'm talking about, when I'm talking about sensual, I'm talking about your senses. It is connected to your flesh. <clears throat> See, because we're sensual beings, we access the world we live in through our eyes, our ears, our nose, and our other body parts. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's a part to us that wants to feel something. Mm-hmm. Come on, Come on help, help me out here because I'm telling you the preacher's preaching good. Yeah. Oh, I didn't feel the Holy Spirit whenever I went to church today. Oh, so you think that this whole walk with you and God is all about you always feeling something? Always getting the freeze on, getting some goosebumps? You can't feel God. 
I will tell you that. You can feel good, God. Hallelujah. God's presence is sometimes palpable. You can, and sometimes you'll even get some goosebumps, and it is the Holy Spirit. But can I tell you a secret? I've been in services before where I know now that it wasn't the Holy Spirit because it was a spirit of a different kind. I didn't know enough about the Word of God then to know any better, but looking back on it, I had goosebumps on my skin. Can I tell you a secret? Satan is a fallen angel, and he also is spiritual, and he can also give you free zones, make you feel good, make you think and deceive you into thinking that something is God when in reality it's not. Oh, you will feel so good. I'm telling you right now, that's what our flesh wants. It wants to feel something. It wants to feel something good. We want, we want to be able to touch it. We want to be able to experience it. So an idol can be any physical object that we have in our lives that stands in the way of God really wants for our lives. It stands in the way of us receiving the blessings that God has for our lives. Listen, I'm saying that in these situations, we're allowing these things, these pleasures to, to provide something for us that God wants to provide. I'm going to say that one more time. Mm -hmm. These pleasures, these things that we allow in our life, whatever these means to you, to me, these things, we allow them in to provide something for us that God wants to provide. Your whole walk with God will be an ongoing test and trial with the enemy trying to get you to replace something else with God. Amen. There's an empty spot in every heart. You know how a preacher would say, there's a God-sized hole in every heart. And the only thing that fits that little piece of puzzle is Jesus. He fits just perfect. And it's true. Amen. And when you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes to live in your heart. But can I tell you something? He will, while he will fill every emptiness, God's people have a hot habit of wandering. Mm -hmm. God's people have a habit of wandering. Even after they get saved, they have a habit of wandering and looking to something else. Man, last night we, we took a couple of the, to, uh, the older kids to, to go see this movie, Unbroken. It was a really good movie, by the way. I'm not going to get into all the details of the movie, but you should go see it. And, uh, and afterwards, I was like, all right, y'all got some spiritual questions for me. And man, one question was, was I thought was, they, they were really a bunch of good questions. But one question had to do with the fact, do you think that God cried? Uh, what did God feel whenever Adam and Eve fell? Do you think God cried? And boy, I'll tell you, you know me, I'm always thinking, I was like, boy, that's a good question. I said, I'm going to try to answer. I can't prove to you that in the garden situation that God cried. But what I can tell you is that Jesus is the perfect physical representation of the invisible God. And Jesus wept whenever Lazarus died. And it wasn't because Lazarus just died because Jesus planned to resurrect him from the dead. Instead, he wept over the sin that had afflicted humanity. So I believe, yes, I can't prove it. God wept. <clears throat> And I said, and just like the fact that I got to give Leah her props for this, because I was talking about the fact that that, you know what? God does cry. He hurts whenever his children wander off and go another way. She said, she said, just like our parents feel pain when their children wander off. I was like, man, that's good. I'm going to have to try to figure out a way to preach that. I said, I won't say your name. She said, no, that's good. You can do that. <laughs> so I gave her a prop. Hey, man, I took a preaching point from a teenager. Praise God. Hallelujah. But, man, I'll tell you what, I learned a lot from them kids anyway, from all of them. It was, we had a great time, but that's another story for another time. Listen, we have a habit of wandering off. We have a habit of wandering off. And when we wander off, we're looking to try to find something to fill that empty spot instead of submitting to Jesus as Savior. I'm sorry, we've submitted to him as Savior, but we've refused to submit to him as King in various areas of our life. And every last one of us in this place deal with that to some extent, in some way, shape or form, some worse than others. What do you mean? What do you mean worse than others, preacher? Sometimes the things that we wander off and embrace hurt us more than other things that we wander off and embrace. But it's still embracing something. You, you understand what I'm saying? You, you go and you reconnect yourself to drugs. 
it's going to cause a lot of damage. But there's other things that you could connect yourself to that it doesn't really destroy you as fast, but it just prevents you from allowing God to have that special place in your heart that he wants. And he's wanting us to learn how to let him be the pleasure that we seek. Amen. This brings me to point number two. The idols in our lives will bring us to a place called Lodabar. Hmm. See, Mephibosheth was from Lodabar. That's point number two. The empty and barren place. The word Lodabar, that's where Mephibosheth was from. Now, I did look this up. I didn't put it in my message, but I looked it up this morning. Mephibosheth was living in a town, a place called Lodabar, which actually means not a pasture. A barren place. Hmm. But he was living in the home of a man named Maker, M A C H I R, which means sold. Ooh. <clears throat> sold like a slave living in a barren place. Broken, lame, crippled, can't walk. Empty. The fall of man, he's empty. You know, I was thinking the other day about how we all as humans have sought pleasure from sources that have left us barren. And empty. I'm telling you, I was just driving down the road, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this word entered my mind that I had learned in nursing school. It's a psychological word, but you know me, I'm about to turn it around and make it spiritual because that's what it is. But whenever that word hit my mind, I was like, dude, I hadn't heard that word in forever. And Sin brings pleasure only for a season. We're, we go after these things hoping to find pleasure. I'm about to break it down a little bit more, but let's look at Hebrews chapter 11, verses 24 through 25. We're talking about Moses right here. I'm talking about a season. We're looking for pleasures and things other than the Lord. It says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, in other words, when he got to the age of maturity, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. What, what, it, what is it in your life that you seek in order to bring pleasure to you, in order to stimulate you? Don't get caught up in, in, the, in the pathway of worried about alcohol and, and drugs and, and fornication. No, I'm talking about any kind of idol, any kind of thing that you put in your life and you refuse to separate from and it stands between you and God and prevents you from being able to get closer to God. Moses said he refused to be called Pharaoh's daughter's son. Do you understand what that means? That means that Moses grew up in privilege. That, mean, that means Moses grew up in the palace. That means Moses had access to everything that he wanted. The other day, Robert was telling me that he had talked to some guy that's in healthcare and the dude was saying, dude, I want an AMG. You may not know what that is, but I'm going to tell you how I know what it is. It's a certain kind of Mercedes Benz. And let me tell you how I know what it is. Because one day I was walking in the parking garage where I used to work, going to my old ratty car. I didn't have my little name on the wall right there. And I walked next to a Mercedes Benz. I was like, wow, look at that car. Dude, I don't even like cars. I was like, man, if I had some money, I'd buy me one of them cars right there. But listen to me. I'm trying to talk about pleasure. And I'm trying to talk about the fact that Mo Moses was a man that was given access to privilege. If he would have been living today, he could have drove an AMG Mercedes Benz. But instead of he refused when he came to a place of maturity and he realized who he was and whose he was. That's right. He knew he was different than them boys that were in the palace with him. How you know that, preacher? Because he was circumcised and they weren't. That might seem weird to you, but that was God's covenant sign that he belonged to them. He knew that them Hebrew slaves out there in the field was more like he was than what the people in the palace were. And when he came to the age of accountability, he said, I can't be Pharaoh's daughter's boy anymore. I can't hold on to the season of pleasure and sin anymore. Instead, I'm going to suffer affliction with the people of God. Listen, sometimes on this earth, I say it too much. But I don't, well, maybe I don't say it enough. This earth we live on is temporary. Sometimes this side of glory is painful. 
But if you're going to yoke yourself up with Jesus, you can't yoke yourself up with the world. Amen. The world will draw you away from the Lord. If you don't believe me, just go on and do it. If you don't believe me, just go on and do it. There's been people in this church that have made that. We used to talk about it all the time. We used to, some people used to say this, take the sin test one more time. I remember Sean used to say, you know, I used to say, sip the poison one more time. Sean used to say, take another lap around the wilderness, just like the children of Israel, refusing to submit to the will and the plan of God. And instead, the children of God going back after it one more time, leading to the same results time and again, leading to emptiness, leading to barrenness, leading to a place called Lodabar. But when the season is over, the person is left barren and empty. Sin in many ways is like a drug. I know that drugs are sin, but I'm just talking about something in general. Sin, at least the ones that stimulate our flesh into feeling good, are like a drug in themselves. I remember I was talking to the kids last night about this. This is what the Lord put on my, my heart. I hadn't even got to that word yet that I was telling y'all about. Just give me some time. Something happens physiologically to our body. It's not just, it's, it's spiritual. <laughs> But the, the spiritual aspect of sin does something to our body. And I happen to know this just because I know a little bit about the human body. Something happens there's, when we engage in behavior that excites us. And sometimes sin excites us. Come on, somebody. Can I get, it? Can I get a, just a little bit of a nod in the hand? That's why people sin. Because it makes their flesh feel good. And when something makes you feel good, guess what happens? A neurotransmitter is elevated in your brain. You get a dopamine bump. More than likely, that's why they call it dope, because it, the neurotransmitter in your brain is called dopamine. It floods your brain, and it gives you a sense of, they call it euphoria or well-being. You remember the first time... If you were a little girl, that cute boy in school called you up and that little fit, the tingling feeling you got. Or the first time that I remember the first time that I, the girl that I thought was pretty, right, you know, acknowledged me or whatever. It's like, oh, man, it made you feel good. Or the first, look, I hate to say it. If you ain't never kissed a boy or you ain't ever kissed a girl, don't listen to the, what the part of the, the, the devil's going to want to try to whisper. The preacher said that it made him feel good because guess what? The first time you cross a line, can I tell you something? The kiss in and of itself ain't bad, but before sex ever happened, the kiss started. The point that I'm trying to make is this, is that lust, whenever you're engaging in something you ain't supposed to be engaging in, all of a sudden it starts to stimulate and it opens up and it awakens the mind to things that it wasn't supposed to be awakened to. You get a flood of dopamine in the brain and it starts hitting receptor sites. And the next thing you know, you want another bump of dopamine. That stuff made me feel good. I want some more. And the next thing you know, you keep searching after and seeking after the pleasure centers. And whenever it's all played out, guess what happens? Crash. You come crashing down. You come crashing down, and the next thing you know, you're looking to seek pleasure from another source. And listen, it can come from all kinds of places. Now, some things will give you a major bump. Other things just give you a little tiny bump. Whether it's a big bump or a little bump, it feels good. And we want more of it. Listen, I put, I, I went ahead and listed some things just because sometimes we're a little too vague. And I didn't want you to. I put whether it's sex, lust, drugs, alcohol, spending more money. All these things, I've gotten a bump from all these things before in my own personal life. Listen, being around certain people. I just like certain people's presence. Get a little bump. All right? Uh, eating. You get a bump from me. And some, some foods just make me feel good, boy. Look, I can't hardly eat pasta no more because I eat a big old bowl of pasta. Make me feel good. All right? I'm not saying you can't eat pasta, okay? But you get my point. Eating sugar. Sugar is a famous one. You get a major bump when you eat sugar. All right? <laughs> Even gossip. Isn't that weird? Have you ever got the bump from gossip? I have. That's a weird thing for a man to admit that. I think I used to be messy. I'm still messy, but I used to be really messy. 
I used to sit there, boy, and I'd like, ooh, it felt so good to talk about that person right there. But I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't stop. I just keep on talking, man. That's right. Dopamine just rushing to my synapses in my brain, giving me euphoria. What ends up happening is when it comes down, that's where the word comes in, anhedonia. That's the word that entered. Like, anhedonia. That's just that you can't even experience pleasure anymore. Get to the point. You know Christians going through spiritual anhedonia. Doesn't experience so much sin. Going, going after. Trying to replace the pleasure in their life. Instead of Jesus. Trying to find something else. Whatever it may be. And, and just leaving them empty. Leaving them barren. The place of Lodabar where Mephibosheth is from. Psychologically people with anhedonia. They can't feel pleasure anymore. They've gotten to a place of depression. Where nothing brings them joy. The dopamine is gone. And now they're barren. And I believe that the reason that people feel this. Is because of sin. It happens to Christians too. And I'm calling it spiritual anhedonia. Sadly people seeking sin. To stimulate the receptors. And get a bump. Instead of seeking Jesus. And asking the Holy Spirit. To be the hope of the heart. And asking him to change the desires of the heart. Amen. You keep on going after that little flood of dopamine. But I'm telling you right now. It's just going to be a temporary fix. And you're going to keep. It's going to keep on leaving you empty. I'm preaching to the preacher. We got to learn how to let Jesus. Be the fulfillment of our heart desire. We talked about idols exterminated. We talked about barren places that are left. Number three, reverence and act of humility. The Bible says he fell on his face. Mephibosheth fell on his face. I'm not going to be able to preach this whole point right here because it's a long one. Some of you have been on Wednesday nights. I preached it in detail on a Wednesday night recently. But look at Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 9 verse 6. It says, now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, was coming to David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, behold thy servant. Now, I really wish I had time to spend on this one. You know what? I think I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to be, I'm going to do this message justice and I'm going to finish this message next week, but I'm going to give you this concept right here. Servant is bond slave. We've talked about it before, but in the book of Deuteronomy, the bond slave was someone who didn't have what was needed in order to function properly. They were, had lost their finances. They were poverty stricken and God gave them an opportunity in the Old Testament to sell themselves as a servant to their fellow brother. The law said for six years you will serve him. You know, God created man on the sixth day. He said on the seventh year you will let him go free. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, the number seven is the day that God rested. He rested from his work. Six days he created the heavens and the earth. On the sixth day, he created man for whom which the heavens and the earth were created that he would dwell upon. And on the seventh day, God rested. And ultimately, Jesus is the fulfillment of that Sabbath day of rest. And what I'm trying to say is this, is that in the seventh year, liberty was fulfilled. He would release them. He would release them. And let me tell you this also. It said that they were free to go. You can go ahead and you can just take off now. But, we'll pick this up again next week. But if your master had been so good to you that you don't want to leave. Y'all remember the story? You get an earring for Jesus. You remember that? What are you talking about? Well, because they would tell him to go up to the doorpost and to put your earlobe against the doorpost and to take an awl. Is that the, we still got awls today? Is that what they call that tool? It's like a pierced uh, po pokey, like an ice pick. And you drive the ear through. And then they put an earring in there. And so they'd walk around with this earring in their ear. And what that showed was that they were a willing servant. Wow. What it showed was is that they had been given their freedom, but instead they chose to stay. Paul said, I'm a bond slave of Jesus Christ. Really? Nobody makes me stay right here. 
You, you got to understand something. The Apostle Paul would plead with people. You have to understand what I'm trying to tell you. He's been so good. I was running around in a place called Lodabar, looking and turning every corner for something that was going to bring me fulfillment and pleasure. And what I ultimately ran into was Jesus. And whenever I gave my heart to him, he said, you're free to go now. If that's what you choose to do because I created you with a free will. You don't have to stay here if you don't want to. But like Peter said, where will we go, Lord? Amen. You alone have the words of yes. life. And I'm going to close with this. Mephibosheth fell down on his face. And he said, Mephibosheth, your servant, Lord. Mephibosheth reverenced the king on that day. The result of that was open arms and a blessing for his life. No longer Lodabar. No longer a barren place. Amen. But instead, an opportunity to live with the king.